All right, good morning. Open your Bibles to the book of First Peter. You'll also want to find Psalm 83. You'll want to find Hebrews chapter 12. And you'll want to find Acts 3 and Romans 11, all those books together. We're going to be going into all those. We've been doing a survey, and I emphasize the word survey, through the Hebrew epistles. And we've been looking at Hebrews so far. We've been looking at the book of James. We dabbled a little bit in 1 Peter last week, but this week we're going to begin looking at 1 Peter, and if we have time, we'll get into 2 Peter a little bit. But both James and 1 Peter begin with an understanding of those people who have been scattered abroad in the dispersion. You remember last week we looked at this map, and this map shows us how that Peter, in Peter chapter 1, verse 1, talks about the strangers that are scattered throughout Pontus and Bithynia and Cappadocia and Galatia and Asia. And that's a lot of the tribulation period happens there. Now, it's all over the earth. The Bible says that trouble is going to be all over the earth. But Israel is going to face a major brunt of the tribulation period. But you also remember that we mentioned that these epistles will give you root signs that let you know what road you're traveling on. I gave a little illustration last week that sometimes you're traveling down a road and after a while you begin to wonder if you're on the right road and you travel and you travel and you go, boy, I wonder if I'm on the right road and you almost want to turn around but then all of a sudden you see that root sign that says root number so-and-so and you go, you know, thank goodness I'm on the right route. Well, the tribulation epistles also let us know when we're on the right route. We're on route 666. That's the route that leads smack dab into Antichrist territory. And when you hit, after the rapture of the church, after the church is raptured out of here, and you're into Hebrews through Revelation, you are on route 666, the Antichrist Highway. And these people who go into the Antichrist territory are in for the ride of their lives. They're in for a troublesome period of time such as the world has never seen before. We who are members of the body of Christ ought to be very thankful that we have been delivered from the wrath to come. So, in the epistle of Hebrews and James that we saw in the past couple of weeks, we clearly saw some of the root signs that let us know that we've left the dispensation of grace and we are now in the tribulation period. If you remember last week, the Jane, Hebrews begins by talking about the last days. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days. The last days we know were interrupted because Peter said that they were in the last days. And the last days were interrupted by an unprophesied event called the dispensation of grace. The last days will be resumed after the rapture of the church and God will continue his prophetic dealings with Israel right where he was back here in Acts chapter 7. We also, he, the book of Hebrews also talked about the prophets. And we know that when the prophets are in view, the body of Christ is not in view because the prophets did not speak about the body of Christ. They spoke about Israel's program and Israel's kingdom and the trouble that Israel would have in Daniel's 70th week. Hebrews chapter 1 also introduced us to the throne again. Now we're, we've got the, the throne of the sun is now in view again in the book of, of Hebrews. And we made some parallels with what happens immediately after the rapture. Some of the parallels that take place here were present in the last days here 
of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7, 5, 6, 7. These chapters, these things resume. We, we remember Peter talked about the throne that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead to sit on the throne of David. That's what he was sit. But the throne was interrupted. It was postponed. And a dispensation of grace entered in. In, second, in Hebrews chapter 2, he also talked about the signs and wonders that these men back here in the early Acts period were performing. Remember that? So you've got last days, prophets, thrones, signs. And then, of, of course, in Hebrews 9, he talked about the second coming. To them that look for him shall he appear the second time. Then we got into the book of James, and James introduced us to a synagogue. James chapter 2, the word assembly is the Greek word synagogue. And you know that when you're confronted with a synagogue, you've left the dispensation of grace. Because the body of Christ doesn't meet in synagogues. But the book of James reintroduces us to the synagogues. James also talked about the kingdom. They, the, the, there's a kingdom prepared for them that love him. Well, the body of Christ doesn't have a kingdom prepared for them that love him. The body of Christ is going into the heavens. Israel is getting their kingdom, which is the subject matter of Genesis. This represents the Gospels, and these are the first chapters of the book of Acts. But the kingdom is what was prophesied back here. The kingdom is what the prophets spoke about. James reintroduces you to that kingdom. He also introduces you to the royal law. Now, this is important because... The royal law, when Jane talks about the royal law, he does make a distinction between the royal law and the law that was given by Moses. In other words, the law that was given by Moses was in effect in Israel's program. It always has been in effect in Israel's program, except for the dispensation of grace. But when Jesus Christ came on the scene, the leaders of Israel have misunderstood the law. They are misappropriating it. They are misapplying it. They are not understanding its purpose. So Jesus Christ comes as the king of Israel, and he is introduced by John the Baptist. He goes up onto the Mount of uh, Temptation, is tempted by Satan for 40 days, 40 nights. He comes down from that mountain, and then he goes and he sits with his disciples, uh, apart with his disciples, and he speaks what is normally called, or what is called, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And the Sermon on the Mount is the constitution for the millennial kingdom of Christ. It is a restructuring of the law. That's what it is. It is a correction of the law. That's why when you read in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ says, Moses says that, but I say this unto you. Moses said that, but I say this unto you. Moses said that, but I say this unto you. What did he do? He corrected their thinking. It was a correction of what they thought it meant and what he now brought into focus for them to what it really did mean. And that became the royal law. If you want to know how people will be living in the millennial kingdom, of Jesus Christ in the world to come, read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and you will find out what law is required of them, what obedience is required of them during that time. You as a Christian in the dispensation of grace cannot live under the law of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It is impossible. You can't do it. There are things in there that you cannot possibly live today. You can't do it. And I hear pastors putting their Christians, their Christian fellowship under the law of the Sermon on the Mount and bind them to it as though it was theirs. They forget that this is the law. Paul says, for we are not under the law, but under grace. We're not under the law. And everything that happened before Paul was saved has to do with the law. And so, but after the rapture of the church, they're introduced again to the royal law. And then James also introduced us to the judge. To the judge. James chapter 5, he says, Behold, the, draw, the, 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 the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Behold, 
the judge standeth at the door. Well, it's obvious when you arrive at Hebrews and onward that the scenery and the landscape has changed from what you in the dispensation of grace are accustomed to seeing. Amen? When you look at 1 Peter, the intensity of the trials begins to increase. What do I mean by that? The tribulation period is divided into two sections of three and a half years each. The first three and a half years being less severe than the second three and a half years. Everybody knows that. But the first half is less severe. Now I asked you to find Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The book of Hebrews and the book of James are instructive to Israel after the rapture of the church for this reason. They are reintroducing Israel to the kingdom program that was waiting for them back here, which they rejected back here. There is a reorientation process, so to speak. You know when you've been away from something for a long time, and if you have a job that's a highly technical job and you've been away, well, before they put you back to work, they're going to reorient you to what you need to do. Well, Hebrews through Revelation is a reorientation for Israel of what their program was back here, which they forfeited when they stoned Stephen. So there's a reorientation. When you, we arrive at the book of Hebrews, which is the first book after the rapture of the church, is the book of Hebrews, they're just getting into the tribulation period. You see, they're just getting into it. The going is easy, so to speak. And that's why you read in Hebrews chapter 12, notice there in verse 4, the writer to the Hebrews says, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. He says, See, you have not yet resisted unto blood, but there is a day coming when the Antichrist breaks the covenant with Israel in the middle of the week. And after that, the intensity of the trials will increase. But the writer to the Hebrews says, you have not yet resisted unto blood. You see that? But there's a day coming when they will be resisting not only unto blood, but unto peril of their own lives and even unto death. As we read in the book of the Revelation. But so far, the book of Hebrews, the writer is basically saying, things are not too severe for you right now. But as we progress further into the tribulation epistles, there is a progression that takes place that becomes very obvious. When you arrive at 1 Peter, at this juncture in the tribulation period, the intensity is increasing and they're being tried and it's obvious when you get to 1 Peter that you have passed this mark. You have passed the line of demarcation, and now there's trouble, real trouble. And when you arrive there, there is a policy of termination against Israel. There is a, a strategy from the Antichrist to completely destroy and annihilate and remove and demolish Israel from off the earth. That exists. Turn, that's Psalm 83. So, turn to Psalm 83. You know, a lot of people think that the Psalms, you know, I, I've heard many Christians over the years say, oh, I love the Psalms. They're so comforting. I get so much comfort in the Psalms, Right? Everybody has said that, right? You need to understand something, folks. The Psalms are about the tribulation period. 
and they're about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That's what they're about. Okay, that's what they're about. And I'll, I'll get into that a little more in a few minutes. But look at Psalm 83, verse 1, a psalm, a song of, or a song or psalm of Asaph. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come and listen, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Now confederacy means that they've joined forces against God that they have united their forces and all of their power against God, and they're out to destroy and terminate and eliminate the testimony that God has in this world through the nation of Israel. They're saying that we don't want there to be a nation anymore. Cut them off. And you need to understand this, folks, that when we arrive at the book of 1 Peter, these are the prevailing conditions that exist in these days of tribulation. This obviously, this verse obviously has not happened in the past. There's, there's like, you know, little spots every once in a while where you see a dictator come on the scene who wants to destroy Israel from off the face of the earth. Alexander the Great... Mussolini, Napoleon, Hitler, they all wanted to destroy the Jews, every one of them. They all thought they were doing God's will, too. And they were all good, devout Roman Catholics, too. But when you arrive at the book of Hebrews, folks, you need to understand what you read in Psalm 83, those are the prevailing conditions. I mean, in the book of 1 Peter. And until now, Hebrews and James, as we've gone through in the past couple of weeks, have taught them how to conduct themselves in the face of this unrelenting opposition and hatred. The last words that we find in the book of Hebrews, or almost the last words, are found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 22, where the, re, the writer to the Hebrews says, And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. In other words, allow the word of exhortation. Receive the word of exhortation. And the word of exhortation is the word of encouragement and the word of comfort. He's saying that the book of Hebrews through Revelation, these are words of comfort for you. These were written for your benefit, so receive these words of comfort, because you will need them in the tribulation period. Hebrews to Revelation are their words of comfort and exhortation for Israel. So before we begin First Peter, I want you to remember this. Remember what the writer to the Hebrews and James have given us so far. The last days, prophets, throne, signs, synagogue, Kingdom, royal law, judge. Those are the subjects that they've introduced you to. Now, I want, before I continue, I want to say this. You know that oftentimes I teach by showing what something is not. I will say, well, let me show you what this does not mean, and then we can better understand what it does mean. I do that frequently. I've done that all of my teaching life, you know, and what I, want, what I want to emphasize is what I'm doing in the epistles of Hebrews through Revelation is not doing a verse-by-verse -verse expository preaching and teaching on them where I explain every verse and every word like I do sometimes. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing in Hebrews through Revelation is I am showing you who they are not written to. I'm showing you that they're not written to you as members of the body of Christ. That's what I'm showing you. 
And I'm showing you who they're not written to by showing you who they are written to and how these doctrines in these books can only apply to them. And before I continue, I want to say one more thing. That doesn't mean that you don't read Hebrews to Revelation because it was written to them. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. All scripture is profitable for doctrine. Now it's important to know when you read a book, it's important for you to understand the doctrine. It's important for you to know who the doctrine is to and who the doctrine is for. Yeah, all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine. It's not all your doctrine. <laughs> Some doctrine belongs to them. Some doctrine belongs to you. Some more doctrine belongs to them. It's all profitable. But you just need to recognize that it's not all yours. And that's what we're doing in this series of messages. We're understanding what is ours, but more importantly, what is not ours. Because it's what is not ours that has produced so much confusion in Christianity today. It's what is, does not belong to us that has produced denominations and schisms and divisions and fighting amongst Christians. Because one guy says, hey, I believe you can lose your salvation over here. What? Paul says, no, you can't. These guys here say, somebody's not too secure. One guy says one thing, another guy says another, another guy says another. Everybody has scripture to support their point of view. Everybody can point to a verse in scripture. See, it's scriptural. Yeah, it's scriptural. And that, you know what? The question today, folks, is not, is it scriptural? The question is, is it dispensational? Does it apply to you today? What God told Adam back here in the garden is not what he told Noah later on. What God told Noah is not what he told Abraham later on. What God told Abraham is not what he told Moses. What he told Moses is not what he told David. What he told David is not what he told Solomon. What he told Solomon is not what he told Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Daniel, the prophets. What, he, they told, what God told them is not what he told John the Baptist. What he told John the Baptist is not what he told Peter. And what he told Peter is not what he told Paul. God has always dealt differently with men. Oh, but I thought God was the same. I thought God never changed. I, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not. God never changes. But his dealings with men have always changed. Always. Because he is God. And with God, all things are possible. God won't change, but the way he has dealt with men throughout history has always changed, has always been different. And you can see that when you read your Bible and you believe the words on the page. Now, if you're not a Bible believer, then you have a hard time with what I'm saying now. So many people today put so much faith in their pastor and like I've said so many times, so many Christians today are guilty of only knowing about the Bible what their pastor knows about the Bible. And I'm going to tell you that's a dangerous way to live because Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, have no confidence in the flesh. Don't put your confidence in a man. Never, 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 never put your confidence in a man. Because a man will lead you astray. There's only one place, folks, that you have your allegiance, and that is to a book that you can rely on, the divinely inspired Word of God. That's it. Everything else is subject to failure and misinterpretation and self-interpretation and private interpretation. You look at this book and you say, what does the book say? I'm so sorry for so many Christians who only know about the Bible what their pastor knows. Because like I said last week, the worst, 
the worst thing that can happen to any preacher is a, is a Bible school education. It's the worst thing that can happen to a preacher. But I'll tell you this, there's nothing like the King James Bible to clear up a Bible school education. This will clear up all your mistakes, and it will clear up all your errors. So this is what these men, Hebrews to James, so far have introduced us to. Subjects and, contra and content and doctrine that has nothing to do with you as a member of the body of Christ. Now remember this, that when you get to 1 Peter, you are still on Route 666, okay? You are on the Antichrist Highway, all right? 1 Peter chapter 1. We've already looked at verse 1 last week and a little bit this morning on being scattered. But notice there in verse 3, beginning at verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice in verse 5 that there is a salvation that is ready to be revealed. In other words, there is a salvation that has not yet been revealed. Right? So there is a salvation that is ready to be revealed. Right? And when does that verse say that that salvation is ready to be revealed? In the last time. In the last time. Do you realize that so far, from Hebrews to 1 Peter, everybody has mentioned the last days. Matter of fact, last time, last days, same thing. Last days, last time, same thing. They mentioned the last days back here. They mentioned the last days back here. But Peter says that there is a salvation that is ready to be revealed. Now, I want to stop here for a moment because there are many people today who, every time they see the word salvation in the Bible, think that it's always meaning the same thing. Just like every time someone sees the word church in the Bible, they think that it always means the body of Christ that we belong to today. Or every time they see the word gospel, they think that it's the gospel of the grace of God and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Of course, that's not accurate, is it? Because in the same way that church and gospel have more than one meaning, salvation also has more than one meaning in the word of God. And it's not complicated. Like, for example, you're familiar with um, Acts chapter 7, where Stephen, as he's preaching, in Acts chapter 7, he talks about the church in the wilderness. In Acts chapter 7, verse 37 and 38, he says, This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Well, folks, the church in the wilderness was back here in the book of Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, with Moses. Did the body of Christ exist back there? <laughs> of course not. But there was a church there, wasn't there? So what is a church? A church is simply a group of called out people. That's all it is. There was a church there. Jesus Christ says, I will build my church. What was he talking about? Was he talking about dispensation of grace? No. He was talking about the kingdom church that he would build. That's what he came to do. He came to establish a kingdom. That's why John the Baptist came and said, repent for the kingdom is at hand. Jesus Christ came down from the Mount of Temptation. His very first words in his earthly ministry to Israel, Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom is at hand. It's at hand. It's on your doorstep. The kingdom that was prophesied back here, it's here, folks. It's so he says, 
I've come to call you out, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now the gates of hell, in the tribulation period, will try to destroy it. But you know, I mean, there is a policy of evil today against the body of Christ. But when Jesus Christ says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, he wasn't talking about the body of Christ. You want to know why we know that? Because when Jesus Christ was in the earth, there was a secret that was hidden God that he was not making known. And he did not make known to anyone. Paul was the first one who received the revelation of that secret that had been hidden God, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. It wasn't made known. Well, if it wasn't made known, they didn't know it. So the ch church doesn't always mean the same thing. Now, we are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are one of the churches that are in the Bible. But we're not the only one. Same with the word gospel. People see the word gospel. Every time they see the word gospel, they think, oh, man, it's the same thing. Well, Jesus Christ went everywhere preaching the gospel of the kingdom with signs following. And everywhere he went, he healed the lame, he healed the blind, made the deaf to hear, made the dumb speak and the, the, the lame to walk. That was the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom was preached back here in the gospels when the kingdom was at hand. But when the kingdom was postponed upon the, upon the stoning of Stephen, the gospel of the kingdom was replaced by the gospel of the grace of God. After the rapture of the church, in the tribulation period, you know what gospel you find in the book of the Revelation? The everlasting gospel, which is not the gospel of the kingdom, and it's not the gospel of the grace of God. You know what gospel it is? It's a gospel of judgment. Judgment has come, is the gospel that they'll be preaching in the Revelation. And we know that's not our gospel. Our gospel, which is unique to our dispensation, is found in verses like Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which ye have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of the grace of God that is preached during the dispensation of grace. <laughs> Boy, it's easy to see, isn't it? It's clear. Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross... It's to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So you and I, in the dispensation of grace, are saved unto eternal life. How? Through faith in the finished work of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ on a hill called Calvary 2,000 years ago. That's how you and I are saved today. Through faith in that finished work, that gospel. You remember when Peter was drowning? He was walking on the water, and he began to sing. And what did he say? Lord, save me. Did that save me mean the same thing as when we say you're saved? No, of course not. So salvation, just like church doesn't always mean one thing, and gospel doesn't always mean one thing, the word salvation doesn't always mean one thing. Thing. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says that there is a salvation that is ready to be revealed. Ready to be revealed. Well, what salvation is that? Well, <coughs> it's the salvation that they're going to get when Jesus Christ returns. And I want you to look at two verses which I asked you to mark. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 and Romans chapter 11.
In Acts chapter 3, Peter is preaching. He's preaching to the leaders of Israel. He's accusing them of having killed their Messiah. And you need to understand something, folks, that when Peter was preaching right here after the cross, after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down, when Peter preached about the cross, he did not preach it as good news. He did not say, oh, you men of Israel, praise God, Jesus Christ has died for you, and now through faith in him you can be saved. That's not what he says. Every time Peter mentions the cross in the first chapters of the book of Acts, it's bad news. You killed him. You murderers. You betrayers. You betrayed him. Look at Acts chapter 3 there, verse 14. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life. That's what you did, he says. And of course, he, every time he talks about the cross, it's along these terms. When Peter was asked in Acts chapter 2, what shall we do? He's preaching and he's preaching, and they said, what shall we do? Peter doesn't say, well, for by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Peter doesn't say that. Peter doesn't say, not by works of righteousness which ye have done. Doesn't say that. Peter doesn't say, therefore, being justified by faith, you have peace. With. Peter doesn't say those things. You know why? Because Peter, in Acts chapter 2, doesn't know that Israel is going to stone Stephen and God's going to raise up the apostle Paul and give him the revelation of a secret that was hidden in God. Peter doesn't know that. So you know what Peter says? Repent. Be baptized in water and you'll get the Holy Spirit. That's what you need to do. But boy, I'll tell you, when Peter's over there in Acts chapter 10, after Paul is saved, now Peter doesn't know Paul is saved. God says, Peter, go to the house of Cornelius. He gets a vision of that sheet coming down from heaven. And God says, rise up, Peter. Kill and eat, Peter says. That, that sheet, unclean animals, represented those Gentiles. And Peter says, not so, Lord. I've never touched anything that is common or unclean. You see, even in Acts chapter 10, Peter knows he's not supposed to go near a Gentile. Yet people say the church started in Acts chapter 2. Man, Peter didn't even want to preach to Gentiles. And when he finally got to the house of Cornelius, he, he knocks on the door, I think. doesn't say that, but <laughs> maybe he did. But he gets to the house of Cornelius and he says, Cornel he doesn't say, Cornelius, praise God, have I got good news for you. Jesus Christ died for you, and salvation has come to you. He doesn't say that. Peter says, Cornelius, you know that it's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to come into someone like you. I'm not even supposed to be here. But God showed me that he's doing something new. And Peter begins to preach to him. And while he's preaching... The Holy Ghost interrupts Peter. That's in Acts chapter 10, verse 44. The Holy Ghost interrupts Peter, interrupts his message, and the, gent and the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles, and then they get baptized in water. And the, and the program changed from repent, believe, and be baptized in water, and then you get the Holy Spirit to believe, get the Holy Spirit, and back then they got dunked in water. But what I want to point to you is this, okay? What, I, what I'm after is this. In Acts chapter 3, talking to you about the salvation that Peter was talking about. Verse 19, Peter says, Repent ye therefore, repent of the murder of your king, is what he's saying, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitute. Whom the heaven must receive is this right here. It's, he ascended up into heaven. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitutions of all things, until the end of the tribulation period, until the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet 
shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear. Okay, now look. In verse 19, look at these words. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In other words, Peter is not saying, hey, all your sins were forgiven back here at the cross. He's not saying that. He's saying, repent that your sins can be forgiven from the times of refreshing of the Lord when that comes. In other words, Peter is saying that there's a time coming when your sins as a nation, Israel, will be forgiven. Now look at Romans chapter 11 because Paul elaborates this subject. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Notice, and so, now when does the fullness of the Gentiles come in? The fullness of the Gentiles goes all the way to the end of the tribulation period. That's the fullness of the Gentiles. Okay? The fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved. Shall be. Notice he doesn't say that they are. Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. God says there is a day when he is going to take away their sins, just like Peter says, when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and that's when he takes away their sins. Paul emphasizes that, and he says, Israel, Peter says there is a salvation now, you're in the truth. There's a salvation that's ready to be revealed. Right there. Right there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through salvation. Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So what they're going through right now, Peter says, is the last time or the last days. And again, those were interrupted, but will resume again after the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. Notice 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Wherein? Wherein, he says in verse 6. Wherein what? Well, according to verse 5, we're in that salvation that is coming to you. In, that, in, the, in the view of that salvation, in the view that Jesus Christ is returning, in the view of that, you rejoice. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through what? Manifold manifold you are in heaviness through manifold temptations now verse 6 introduces you to manifold temptations or trials and but notice that these are only for a season they're for a season well let me ask you this in the light of what's happening in the book of first peter how long is this season Seven years. Peter says, though manifold temptations for a season. Daniel's 70th week. Seven years of tribulation. And there is a purpose for, these, for this season. Notice verse 7. That the trial of your faith. Oh man, listen, that is a very important phrase right there. That the trial of your faith. You know what? That's what God wants from them. That was their problem. Back here, their problem was they didn't believe. They didn't have faith. So now God says that the trial of your faith being much more precious 
being much more precious than of gold. You see, that's what God is interested in restoring their faith that they didn't have back here in the tribulation period. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now notice in verse 7 that they're going to be tried by what? That the trial of your faith, being much more precious of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire. Be tried with fire. You remember last week how we mentioned in James chapter 5 that James brings in the illustration of Job as an example of suffering and patience? Remember that? Job is a picture of a, a member of the remnant, a, rem, a member of Israel who is going through the tribulation period. That's what Job is. Job goes through all those problems and all those hard times, and then at the end of his ordeal, he's restored sevenfold. Remember that? And then after the book of Job is the book of Psalms. King David shows up. What's that? It's a picture of the king sitting on the throne. That's your Bible. Book of Job, king sitting on the throne. That's your Bible. It's right there in the Old Testament. Prophecy. Job says in Job 23, But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Peter says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold. See the correlation? See the parallel? I know I didn't ask you to find this, but Ezekiel, turn to Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel, that's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. <coughs> Ezekiel chapter 22. I want to show you how God, the purpose for these fiery trials. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 14. He says, Can thine heart endure... Or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. And I will scatter thee among the heathen. And this, Now that's the fifth course of punishment, which we haven't looked at yet, but that's the fifth course. And disperse thee in the countries and will consume thy filthiness out of thee. And thou shalt take thine inheritance in thyself in the sight of the heathen, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye are all become dross, behold, therefore, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and ye shall be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. The fifth course of punishment ends in the tribulation period when God is pouring out his wrath upon Israel. Verse 7, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Notice that the manifold temptations of verse 6 precede the appearing. They precede the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Job, fire preceded the arrival of King David. 
In the tribulation period, fire precedes. I, want you to, I know I didn't ask you to turn to this either, but look at Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah speaks of a time of burning and fire before their eyes behold the king in his beauty. Isaiah chapter 33. Verse 10. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. You know where that puts you? Now will I rise? The doctrine of God arising is the doctrine of God rising to come in judgment. You know where that puts you? Acts chapter 7. They were stoning Stephen. Stephen says, I see the Son of Man, what? Standing. What had he done? He arose. He arose. To do what? To come judge. The tribulation was going to happen over here. But it was postponed, and it's going to happen there. But the doctrine of arising, O oh Lord, puts you in Acts chapter 7. James says, the judge standeth at the door. Arise, O oh Lord. He says, the judge is standing. When you, when you, in the dispensation of grace, where is Jesus Christ right now? Seated. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, if ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Jesus Christ today is seated. He was standing in the book of Acts, chapter 7. He sat back down in the dispensation of grace. But when he arises again, you know it's time for judgment. He's coming to judge. Isaiah 33, 10, now will I arise. If you, when you know that when God is rising... He's rising from a seating, seated position. Right now he's seated. Today he's seated. And you're at peace with God. You don't have a thing to worry about. <laughs> Remember what I said, in the dispensation of grace, Mozart, Beethoven, nice, soft, doo -doo -doo, melod melodic music, soothing, calming, faith, peace, joy, love, boom, boom, boom. And then after the rapture, the Jaws music. Do, 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 do. Tribulation is here. Trouble is here. Isaiah 33, 10. Now will I arise, saith the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. Ye shall conceive chaff. Ye shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. And the people shall be as the burnings of lime. As thorns cut up shall they be burned in the fire. Hear ye that are far off what I have done, and ye that are near acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Who's going to do that? Who's going to be able to survive this? Who's going to be able to go through this time of fire? The trial of fire. Who's going to be able to do that? In the tribulation period, the answer, verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. You know what that is in the tribulation period. In Revelation chapter 12, they're led out into the wilderness, and God feeds them supernaturally, just like he did back here in Exodus when he poured manna down from heaven. He's going to give them. Their bread shall be sure. There's going to be security for them because they're doing these right things. And you know what will happen after that? Verse 17, thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall be behold the land that is very far off. The king in his beauty is when he returns and he sits on his throne. The times of refreshing that Peter called, talked about in Acts chapter 3, the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. You know, 
So many people today, they read that verse from the presence of the Lord and they think of that, that emotion they feel when they're, oh man, the band is playing and the music and they're swaying back and forth. That's the re- oh, the presence of the Lord. That's not what Peter's talking about. Peter's not talking about that refreshing of the Lord. That's the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord when the Lord is literally present with them. Literally in their midst. And he says, they shall behold the king in his beauty. That land that is afar off is the world to come that the writer to the Hebrews talks about in Hebrews chapter 2. The world to come. The millennial reign of Christ. That's the land that is afar off. Remember when the Bible says, and Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. What was it? The millennial kingdom of Christ. That's what it was. That's what he was looking for. That's what he was looking out there into the future. Because God promised him a land back there. He promised him that land. That's where they, that land is restored unto them. That's why the prophet Isaiah says that Israel will be married again to her land. Because that's what a nation is. A nation is a group of people who have their own piece of land that's theirs. Israel doesn't have that today. They're scattered all over the world, but then they're going to be reunited to their land in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But before the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, before the millennial kingdom, Jesus Christ has to return. Before he returns, before Jesus Christ returns, before they see the king in his beauty, fire, fire, burning. I'll tell you this, I would be negligent right now if I did not bring in what John the Baptist said to those people in Matthew chapter 3. So just turn there too, okay? <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3. See, when John the Baptist arrives on the scene, you, gotta, you have to remember this. You, ha- you always have to, when you look at the Word of God, you have to look at the prevailing conditions right there. Don't take doctrines from the Apostle Paul and bring them back here and make these things back here mean what Paul meant out there. Because what God was doing back here is not what he's doing in the dispensation of grace with us Gentiles. So when John the Baptist comes on the scene, he only has one frame of reference upon which to base what he's going to say, and that's the scriptures which came before. That's all, okay? So in Matthew chapter 3, I'm almost done. Matthew chapter 3, notice there verse 5, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the regions round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Well, where does he know about a wrath to come? Well, there's only one place John could ever know about a wrath to come. There's been 400 years of silence right here between Malachi and Matthew. There's been 400 years of silence. And all of a sudden, he comes out of the wilderness, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way. Where does he know about a wrath to come? There's only one place he could have known it. From the prophets. That's all he had. He didn't have the writings of the Apostle Paul. You see what I'm saying? Verse 8 Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Now they've been warned of the wrath to come. <clears throat> Verse 9 And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. And therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after, after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the, fat, the chaff with unquenchable fire." Verse 10, 11, and 12 all end with the doctrine of fire, all of them. They all end with fire. And when he says in verse 11 that he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, 
He was talking about Pentecost. Pentecost is where the Holy Spirit came down on the nation of Israel. So John the Baptist says he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. The tribulation period. That's what John the Baptist is talking about. Okay? Now in 1 Peter, here's a group of people who will witness the appearing of Jesus Christ. And they're going to be tried by fire before they see the king in his glory. They're going to go through manifold temptations. All of these things must happen. And then notice the end of verse 7 in 1 Peter chapter 1, before the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now on this chart right here, where does the appearing take place? Where is it over here? Is it over here? Where is it? Here? Here? No, here. It takes place there. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ, right there at the end of the tribulation period, and then the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years. Okay? I know you knew that. So, so far, I'm almost done. There's no way I'm going to finish what I thought I was going to do. I thought I wanted to get through 1 Peter today. Boy, I thought I wanted to get into 2 Peter today, too. But since we have arrived at Hebrews after the rapture of the church, we've been confronted with the second coming of Jesus Christ more than once. Hebrews chapter 9, the writer to the Hebrews says, Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. So the writer to the Hebrews is writing to people who will be alive, who will be on earth when Jesus Christ appears the second time. We know the rapture. We're going to be out of here, so we won't be alive. The writer to the book of James says, Behold, the judge standeth at the door. We don't have to worry about that. Peter says that the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, when James says to his writers to be patient unto the coming, unto the coming of the Lord, for the Lord, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, behold, the judge standeth at the door. That's in James chapter 5. The reason that I know that James can't be writing that to me is because my relationship with Jesus Christ is not as my judge. Jesus Christ is not my judge. He's my Savior. He saved me. My relationship with him today is a relationship that's based on grace. Romans chapter 5 verse 2 talks about the grace wherein we stand. We're standing in the grace of God today. That's where you are. And if you were not standing in the grace of God, you'd be in trouble. But today, Jesus Christ is the head of the body of Christ. And he's coming to get us before the Lord's day of wrath takes place at the end of that tribulation period, okay? So, we've been delivered from the wrath to come. That is a doctrine, folks, that is worthy of glorying in, of being excited about, okay? So, as we enter these tribulation epistles, the second coming of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, is a very paramount doctrine. It's a prominent doctrine, it's a glaring doctrine. You can't miss it. I'm just, look at, go back to 1 Peter, okay? And I'm just going to show you very quickly um, some verses in 1 Peter that, that show you what Peter's talking about. 1 Peter chapter 1. For, of course, we got at the end of verse 7 there, the, the appearing of Jesus Christ. Down in verse 13, wherefore, well, let me just tell you this. At the end of verse 12, you've got angels. I'm putting them up on the chart here. Angels, because angels show back up in the tribulation. In the dispensation of grace, folks, you don't have your own personal little angel watching over you. Okay? You don't have that. The Apostle Paul talks about, in, in Colossians chapter 2, about people looking into those things that they don't understand, saying that they've seen angels and all that. No. You don't have an angel. I know people write books about know your angel's name and all that. No. You don't have an angel. You've got the mighty Holy Spirit living inside of you, and you've got the Word of God to guide you. You don't have an angel hovering over your car when you're driving down the road, and, oh, that near miss was an angel. No, you don't have that, okay? 
The reason you missed that car is because you turned the wheel. That's why you missed the car. It wasn't an angel. But in the tribulation period, the seven churches of the Revelation, they have their angel. It's the seven angels that pour out their wrath. The writer to the Hebrews in the last chapter of the last verse of chapter one reintroduces you to angels who are ministering spirits who shall be sent forth to them who are the heirs of salvation. You're not an heir of salvation. You didn't inherit salvation. You got salvation by faith, a free gift of God. That's not an inheritance. That's a free gift. Israel have an inheritance, though. They've got an inheritance that was promised them back here, and they are the heirs of of salvation. They're the heirs of salvation. You're not an heir of salvation. That's why Peter says that there's a salvation that's ready to be revealed here. If there's something ready to be revealed for them, it's their inheritance. It's their salvation when he comes and takes away their sins. So I put angels there. Then verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end. I've mentioned this many times. When you, hear, when you read those words to the end in the King James Bible, it's never referring to the end of your life. It's never referring to the end of the church age. It's always referring to the end of the tribulation period. Hope to the end, he tells them. And then he goes on. For the grace, notice this verse. This is awesome. Verse 13, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says there is a grace that is to be brought to them. Their salvation is ready to be revealed, and there is a grace that is to be brought unto them. You know, people who say that Peter and Paul both talked about grace. Yeah, P Paul talked about grace, for by grace you're saved. But when Peter talks about grace, he says it's the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what we talked about in Acts chapter 3 and Romans chapter 11. Notice also, in uh, I'm jumping now, okay, because I'm done. I'm out of time. But um, there's a lot of verses in, 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 in Peter. Man, he talks about the priesthood, okay, which I'm going to put on the board. Oh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, then the priesthood. He talks about the royal priesthood. You're not a royal priest. You're the member of the body of Christ. Okay? And also, I'm probably going to stop only because there's too many important things to touch on. But notice uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 4, 7. Peter says, but the end of all things is at hand. Who is he writing to? The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Verse 13, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed. Here's Christ's sufferings. After the rapture of the church, here's Christ's sufferings. Here's the glory that shall be revealed. And they shall behold the king in his beauty. Look also at verse 17, chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. That's how I know Peter's not writing to me. Because I know that judgment is not coming to the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not looking for judgment. All of your sins were judged on the cross of Calvary when Jesus Christ spread his arms and died for you. God judged your sins right there. God's not waiting to judge you again. Your sins were paid for. You've been forgiven all trespasses in Christ. You're accepted in the beloved. You have a unique relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. He's not waiting to judge you. He paid for your sins. He's been judged for your sins. So, but now here's a group of people. The time has come that judgment is coming to them. Well, who's that? Well, it's Israel. It's always been them who are getting judged. Jesus Christ was judged. For us, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. For God hath made him to become sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. That's us. Just one more thing. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, 
and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. The glory that shall be revealed, folks, is always out here. It's always out there. It's never during the dispensation of grace. It's always after the rapture of the church, out there, after the tribulation period. First, first Peter chapter 5, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear. Now, who's the chief shepherd? Well, the chief shepherd is Jesus Christ. But guess what? You're not sheep. He's not your shepherd. You are members of the body of Christ. He is your resurrected head right now. Okay? That's what you are. You're not sheep. He's not your shepherd. He's Israel's shepherd. But the body of Christ doesn't have a sheep-shepherd relationship with him. We have a body and a head relationship with our Lord. That's what we have today. And then just one more thing. Chapter 5, verse 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while. He said in chapter 1 if, that your suffering, if need be, for a season. For a season. Now he says, after you've suffered a while. How long is that while? Seven years. Daniel's 70th week. A time of suffering for Israel. Now, there's many more things, folks, but I'm going to stop now because our time is up. And, uh, but just notice that Peter is not writing to you. It's clear and it's glaringly obvious who Peter is writing to. He talks about the end. Peter talks about the end in verse chapter 4, verse 7. I just want you to notice this real quick in closing, okay? Hebrews, Hebrews introduces you to the prophets, the last days, the throne, signs and wonders, the second coming. James introduces you to those who are scattered, the synagogue, the kingdom, work, second coming, the judge, endurance, they that, happy are they that endure. Who are they? Matthew 24, 13. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come, and he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. So happy are they that endure to the end of the tribulation period. And then Peter talks about that three, I mean, uh, James talks about that three and a half years. He uses the prophet Elijah of God withholding rain. Three and a half years he talks about. And then in 1 Peter, he talks about those who are scattered. He talks about the last time, manifold temptations, the fire, the appearing, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Angels are back on the scene, the royal priesthood, the day of visitation, which I did not get a time to do today. This is an in interesting Doctrine right there, the day of visitation. Peter talks about that in uh, 1 Peter chapter, chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 12, he talks about the day of visitation. Peter says the end is at hand. Talks about the glory being revealed. Talks about judgment coming at the house of God. Talks about the chief, sh chief shepherd. Talks about after you've suffered a while. The, this is what you're introduced to in just these three epistles, after the rapture of the church. Not one word of these sounds like anything Paul ever wrote to you in the dispensation of grace. Not one. Not one. So it's clear that after the rapture of the church, there's a body of doctrine that is written exclusively for Israel going through that troublesome time. Amen? All right, next week we'll continue with Second Peter. All right, let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we're thankful for this time that we can spend in the Word of God. We pray that the words that are found in Hebrews through Revelation will minister to our hearts in the, in, in the reality that we won't be there to experience the wrath that's coming upon the earth. We're thankful that we're members of the body of Christ and that we have a relationship with Christ and we'll be taken out of here before that great and terrible day of the Lord. We pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.